So today, we're really excited to be joined by Zach Kieran from the Fromius team. Uh, we're here to learn a little bit more about simplifying your system design with modern string inverters, and he's going to take us through it. Let me just pull up my screen here. Sure. Okay, and we can all see this presentation well then? Yeah, it looks good from here. Awesome. Well, hello everyone. My name is Zachary Kieran, and I'm here today to present Simplify Your System Design with Modern String Inverters. So I started at Fronius in 2019. My job for the last year has been analyzing system design parameters and site details for inaccuracies that violate warranty guidelines. I've seen many design plans and have had the unfortunate duty of making out of warranty decisions and having those difficult conversations. Over complexity and invalid parameters have been the key issue in these cases. System design matters. Successful systems have certain criteria that must be met to be considered perfect. Perfect system design needs to be future-proof and flexible, reliable and safe, and optimized for excellent yield. These attributes are what drive our core motto at Fronius, the company's driving vision, a world supplied by 100% renewable energy. So when I joined, I was surprised to find that, Sol that Fronius was a leader in solar technology and was excited to contribute to the idea of 24 hours of sun. In that time, I've been fortunate to work with many design applications and meet passionate people that are devoting their every everyday lives to this vision. PV has grown from a novel idea of how electricity could be generated by the sun, now being considered by many as the most significant energy source expected to power the globe by 2050. If you look at inverters and their accessories from decades past, systems were quite complex and consisted of many add-on components that were often necessary. The inverters themselves were limited in their design flexibility and software capabilities, having low voltage windows, transformer losses, and high cost. But as all technology does, string inverters became smarter, more integrated, and better connected, resulting in high efficiency with simple design plans. We have proven to grow and innovate alongside the PV industry and our inverters of the present and future will power the prosumer world with perfection. String inverter design windows have been expanded. Shade mitigation technologies have been developed. Wi-Fi monitoring with SunSpec communication protocols have been integrated and superior safety standards have been followed. The PV industry as a whole has innovated as well with solar modules becoming more powerful and efficient year over year. Our flagship residential inverter is the Fronius Primo. The Primo is our single phase inverter ranging from 3.8 kilowatts to 15 kilowatts, perfect for small to large residences. The Primo features two maximum power point trackers and can be integrated into a single phase of a 208 volt grid or on a split phase 240 volt grid. It is important to note that there are two variants of, of the Primo with different physical size and design parameters. So be sure to use the correct da data sheet. Our flagship commercial order is the Fronius Simo Advanced. The Simo Advanced is our three phase inverter line ranging from 10 kilowatt to 24 kilowatt. It also features two MPP trackers and the power line communicator for SunSpec rapid shutdown solutions. Each inverter model can be purchased with a data manager card included in our web server versions or without a data manager card in our light versions. So, so Zach, that, that flexibility that you talk about um, in terms of which voltage uh, the system needs to operate on is really, really interesting. And it's something that a lot of our customers really like. Just how flexible is it? Like, can uh, Fromius Simo Advanced be configured for like a 240 high leg grid, for example? What, what are the limits there? Yeah, so the excellent, that's, it's a great feature on these inverters. So each one of these inverters uh, come with their own grids that they can be set up on. 
the the DC voltage windows for every inverter is a little bit different, but our Primo is goes all the way down to 90 volt on MPP2. But the 208 uh, version of the Simo Advance can be placed on a 240 volt high leg delta grid. The, the L3 terminal will have the high leg on it, so it's important to note that. So make note that the inverter's 10-year warranty begins when it is shipped from Fronius. Therefore, the commissioning or therefore the warranty expiration will not align with the date of commissioning. To ensure that the warranty of the product starts on the date of commissioning, please register the product warranty with the link above. Multiple warranties for systems with multiple inverters can have their registration done at one single click. The QR code on the screen gives a detailed video on warranty registration. Additional products may be purchased to enhance the system capabilities, but it's only to enhance the system's capabilities only, only by itself. So the Digi cellular modem is used to bring internet activity to remote locations for use of the Fronius solar web monitoring. A 650 megabyte cellular plan is recommended to pair with the cellular modem to deliver monitoring data remotely without the need for an internet connection. The Fronius smart meter can be purchased to add home consumption data to SolarWeb. And customers who are interested in limiting their energy consumption or want to see statistics on production versus consumption will fall in love with the added data to SolarWeb. The component is also required for zero feed-in limitations that are imposed by some utilities where, ap where applicable. The Fronius Data Manager card is required for inverter online monitoring. If installed in an inverter, the data manager will send information of up to 100 inverters to SolarWeb, which will benefit your customers and operation and maintenance procedures. SolarWeb is our online inverter monitoring platform, which gives detailed information on system performance, error messages that may occur, and detailed site parameters such as voltage and current of maximum power point trackers. The data manager supports third-party interface via Modbrush protocols as well. Sorry, so um, we, we did have a, a question come in here as well. Um, so, so my first question is, is like, how does one data manager collect information from a hundred inverters on a site? That's that's a tremendous um, scale. Um, so, what, can you say a little bit more about what's going on there? Yeah, so it's pretty easy actually. The inverters can be daisy chained together to create an information path that we call the Solar Net Loop. All data collected from each inverter is exported to the master inverter with the data manager card installed. And from that data manager card, it, the, all of the packets of information go to the solar web servers uh, back in Austria in our, at our Fronius headquarters there. And um, that's where all of the information is sent to. Mm -hmm. From and solar web, you'll be able to access all of the site's information as well. Oh, okay. Awesome. And, and um, can you say a little bit more about how the digi cellular, cellular modem works? Um, there's a question in the Q&A about is a digi cellular modem 5G? Um, and there's that recommendation of a 650 megabyte per month data plan. Is it, our customer is going out and buying SIM cards for this device or how are they, how are they um, getting that? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, these digi modems are used with a SIM a SIM card. Um, I I am not actually sure if Digi uses five G or if it's just L, on the LTE tower. Um, but I do know that the six hundred and fifty megabyte plan per month is uh, that is like the lowest data plan that we can that you can pair with the Digi. So if you wanted to go a little bit further, you can get more um, points of data throughout the day. But really, the only thing that the Digi does is export data to SolarWeb once per day. Gotcha. Okay, so you've, you've got it all kind of like hubbed and then it, it exports it once. Yes. Fantastic. 
So modern spring inverters have innovated on voltage windows for power point trackers. They have dropped the clunky and inefficient transformers and expanded on capabilities. And this is Superflex design. A module consists of an open circuit voltage and a short circuit current, which model the characteristics of a single module. A string is a combination of modules in series with DC positive and DC minus strung together. You will notice that combining modules in series affects the open circuit voltage characteristics of the string. When two of these strings are input to the same maximum power point tracker, the two strings operate in parallel. The short circuit current of the two strings are added together due to parallel circuit properties. The total amount of modules in the entire array dictate the wattage that the system may produce. Inverters of decades past had small, win uh, had small voltage windows and configuration possibilities. Multiple power point trackers allow for different module orientations string configurations, or tilts. The system may be split among the independent trackers as needed from a 50-50 split all the way to a 90-10 uh, split in terms of power. So with the Fronius Superflex design, you can design systems from incredibly low startup voltages, as low as 80 volts or three modules, all the way up to a maximum DC voltage allowed by the NEC code. An example would be the Fronius Primo single phase inverter, which can handle up to 1000 volts in non-residential applications. This allows for a maximum number of modules in one string and a reduced balance of system cost. The combination of wide voltage windows for various string lengths, multiple trackers for both symmetric and asymmetric designs, and a wide range of power classes make Fronius Snap Inverters super flexible and provides a solution for any system. While inverter oversizing is not new to the solar industry, there are still inverter manufacturers that do not offer an attractive DC to AC ratio for their inverters. This highly impacts costs and profitability of a solar system. Therefore, it's important for system designers and their solar installers to have a closer look on the oversizing capabilities of inverters to tap into their hidden power potential. Inverter oversizing refers to adding more DC power to an inverter than it is rated to output. For example, if you were to connect six kilowatts of DC power to a five kilowatt inverter, you would effectively oversize the system by 20%. The five kilowatt peak will only occur in perfect weather conditions and may not produce its peak power for long unless the system has been oversized. Modern high quality inverters like the Fronius Snap Inverter can handle DC power of up to 150% of the inverter's nominal output power. While the efficiency of our string inverters is quite stable over the whole power range, the closer the inverter operates to its nominal power, the more efficient it will be. By oversizing a system, the operating point of the inverter is at a higher power throughout the day, allowing the inverter to reach its most efficient power production early in the day and maximizing overall energy yield in all weather conditions. Oversized systems are often much more cost effective. For the price of a lower power class inverter, you can support a larger array. Inverters with a poor DC to AC ratio or no oversizing capabilities whatsoever do not provide this cost saving, increasing the cost per watt significantly. Another benefit to oversizing is not having to upgrade the AC load center to support a larger inverter. The cost of upgrading service panels can be high. Instead, Oversizing the inverter will allow you to apply more solar panels to the structure without surpassing current limitations of the load center bus bars. This will allow you to maximize the solar yield of the system. In commercial, rooftops, and ground mount systems, 
oversizing reduces the number of inverters needed to support the available array size and its kilowatt power on a given roof. This not only reduces the initial cost, but also the operation and maintenance expenses, resulting in a better return on investment. So the overall voltage in a system is limited by NEC code 690.7 or 600 volts for residential applications. The temperature of the ambient air around the PV system decreases or as the temperature of the ambient air around the PV system decreases, the DC voltage of the system will rise. The characteristics of this change are included on the application notes or specification sheet of the given panel. The expected lowest temperature for the geographical location is used to calculate the maximum DC voltage of the system. Please see your inverter's data sheet for specifications on maximum allowable DC voltage. You can see from the graph, the relationship temperature and voltage have together. And so let's just stop here for a second and kind of talk about how this would work in a real world application. So um, how can installers know, you know, what expected temperatures to plan for in a given location? Are they just going to, um, specific data set that you all rely on, or do you have, how, how do we manage that? Yeah, so there, there's a couple of ways you can uh, use the, you, there's a couple of figures you can use to calculate the expected lowest temperatures. The use of ASHRAE data, or the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, dry bulb temperature parameters can be used to calculate the highest expected DC open circuit voltage of the plan system. Uh, this is a good average statistic of the expected lowest temperatures in the location as it's derived from the historical data. We call it the ASHRAE data, and if the ASHRAE data cannot be acquired, the use of historical lowest temperatures located in the area is used to calculate open circuit voltage. Okay, and we can, um, we can, we can kind of put that in the chat as well, just so folks who want to look it up can, can find it afterwards. Sure. Okay, so we'll move on. So here we can see the IV curve of a given module. The IV curve is defined as a relationship between operating voltage and the current or power that can be drawn from the module at that given voltage. For a specified voltage, power and current will be supplied by the module. As voltage increases, the power supplied by the module be, will be increasing until a maximum power point is found, at which point change in voltage will negatively impact performance of the module. You can see that there is a point at which current and production decreases exponentially as voltage approaches the open circuit. The primal and the SIMO advanced inverters have two maximum power point trackers. The MPP tracker algorithm of the inverter sets the voltage at which the string will operate the most efficient. The maximum power point tracker consists of boost buck circuitry, which can step up or step down the voltage to find the maximum power point. The maximum power point at the highest voltage level is considered by us the global maximum power point. At this point, any change in voltage whatsoever negatively impacts production. And you can see it there on the graph. So let's do a quick design notes for the snap inverter. Each maximum power point tracker is separated on the DC input terminal block. The maximum usable current for each maximum power point tracker is, dif is different. So be sure to detail this in your system designs. The SIMO advanced and the, and the 10 through 15 pr kilowatt primos have an option to include DC surge protection devices and overcurrent pr uh, protection fuses. The fuses may be installed on the DC positive, DC minus, or both polarities. There's 12 fuse holders that are included with pass-through bolts attached 
So be sure to remove them if fusing is needed for the given system. DC strings can be combined together external from the inverter in a combiner box where all strings are combined together and one home run string is run to the inverter. In these cases, the current flowing into one inverter DC terminal can exceed the 15 amp maximum. In these cases, DC collection combs spread the current evenly among each terminal to lower the total current entering one terminal. And these are included with the SIMO inverter. Hmm. So just kind of thinking through some of that, when exactly would uh, fusing be required for a string? Yeah, that's a good question, Eric. Applications would, would drive that. Yeah, so um, overcurrent protection fuses, they protect the conductors and the modules in the case that a string faults with another current or in the, in the case that it faults with another string and begins backfeeding current to other strings. The expected DC current could be three times greater than expected when these faults occur. So the best rule of thumb is that systems that have three or more strings input to the same maximum power point tracker will require fusing. But please see the NEC 690.8 code for more information on these calculations. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And good to have that general rule of thumb of, of you know, three strings or more. Yeah, that's a, that's a really basic rule of thumb and it's, it's true for about 99% of the systems. So what about module level shutdown? Well, module level shutdown is becoming a norm in the industry. A deeper look behind the high market shares also show that installers in the U.S. are very dissatisfied with the domination of module level shutdown. Facing limited customer choice, high cost, and high failure rates and safety risks, module level shutdown still has grown significantly since the adoption of the NEC 2014 code. A major criteria to make a good module level shutdown solution is to re reduce the number of connection points in a system, as these are the major root cause for arcing and fires. Fewer connection points means less risk of arcing. Cost effectiveness drives the adoption of solar energy. The more affordable solar is for customers, the quicker we will be able to transition to a renewable energy supply world. In addition, solar systems are 20 plus year investments and must operate reliably over their lifetime. Any system that has less components and less exposure of power electronics to harsh rooftop environments will show higher reliability. Factory integrated shutdown solutions and modules can make installation simple and easy and allowing an open standard gives manufacturers a base to develop safe and efficient features and connections. Yeah, and I, I know that uh, a lot of work has gone into developing the, the SunSpec um, standards and, and kind of trying to get those to be adopted by the broader industry. Um, so does Fronius actually make uh, their own um, module level rapid shutdown solution or wh how, what's their what's their strategy for dealing with that um, that requirement when it arises? Gotcha, Aaron, that's a good question as well. Um, no, currently module level shutdown is not something that we support as a whole in the, in, in the PV industry. Uh, most module level shutdown devices do not meet the criteria that we believe to be a good solution. We offer a rapid shutdown box that is compliant with NEC 2014. Uh, these shutdown boxes operate as a string shutdown rather than a module level shutdown, reducing the components and connection points. But since the NEC 2017, uh, they're not applicable in a lot of markets. We do have certification with third party manufacturers, however. One example of a SunSpec shutdown device compatible with the SIMO Advanced is the AP Smart RSD-S-PLC. This solution is PVRSS certified and works based on the SunSpec rapid shutdown industry standards. The SIMO Advanced controls a signal on the DC strings 
which signals the rapid shutdown to either operate or disconnect. Another example of a compliant rapid shutdown device is the IMO Fire Raptor. This is an NEC 2017 compliant rapid shutdown solution, which operates using a sing signal wire that is powered low when AC grade is lost to the inverter. These are examples of devices that can be used when NEC 2017 code must be met. So with two MPP trackers, complex systems, this uh, complex system design is made super easy. Both maximum power point trackers should be used in cases where the maximum power point curve of two strings should be tracked separately. Some of these cases include east and west arrays, additional side arrays, arrays with different tilt angles, and areas where an array, array is partially shaded. The ID curve between the strings of each subsystem or shaded string will have a different IV curve characteristic. Each of these examples have circumstances in which we would want to track the strings of each inverter separately. And there are various reasons why shade can occur in a system from snow buildup in the winter to leaves piling in the fall. And, existers, and existing structure casting shadows. It can be difficult or non-feasible to limit the shading of a string. Luckily, Fronius string inverters can mitigate the loss in energy yield and outperform other solutions to correct this. So um, how would a string inverter mitigate shading of effects of a whole string if, if there isn't like an MLP situation? Uh, good question, Aaron. Uh, the answer is in the software and panel design. So shade is not always a limiting factor in yield reduction. It is, a, it is common for solar installers to assume that modules that are shaded are causing loss in production of all modules in a string. This is simply not true. The weakest module in a string does not negatively impact the string itself. Module manufacturer, ma manufacturers install bypass diodes inside the panels. These diodes are inactive when shading does not exist, acting as a simple pass-through. However, when the majority of cells are shaded, the bypass diode activates. When cells are shaded, they act as loads on the DC side, causing loss and degradation of the panel if bypass diodes were not present. When the, di when the diode is reverse biased, the individual cells that are in series with the diode do not produce, nor do they consume any electrical power, and the module operates at 66% of its total production. The result is that modern modules minimize losses due to shade, and the string as a collective is not negatively impacted. The bypass diodes are not activated in cases where only a small portion of the ray is shaded. But we will, or the, I'm sorry, the bypass diodes are not activated when only small portions of the module are shaded. But we will see how the software solves that solution itself. So of course, in cases where shade can be avoided, it is imperative to do so. Shade does affect a string in a different way. Inverters of decades past would often get stuck while searching for the MPP of a shaded string. This is because the IV curve of a shaded string becomes shaped like an S with two peaks forming. The local maximum power point causes the inverter to assume that a higher operating voltage is necessary for the maximum power point when there is a global maximum power point which can be used to generate more yield. We can see the differences in the IV curve by time of day shading occurs on a given string. DC optimizers used to be the solution to combat the lower efficiency of shaded strings in the past. Today, optim the, strong the optimizer's strongest element is integrated into the Fronius inverter itself with the dynamic peak manager. The software-based shade mitigation feature 
of modern string inverters outperform DC optimizers in shaded conditions while eliminating the need for additional hardware. The Fronius Dynamic Peak Manager is an enhanced maximum power point tracking software that scans the entire IV curve when searching for the optimal operating point and not just the local maximum power point. The global maximum power point is discovered and the inverter shifts to the operating voltage to the best yielding operating point, all done with intelligent software. Just like all technology, software is replacing the need for expensive and clunky add-on equipment, simplifying your PV design. So let's look at a specific example with hard shade from a building. We have a 3.3 kilowatt system with a southward orientation. The structure of the house is causing shading in the early morning, which clears in the mid-afternoon. What would the difference be with and without the dynamic peak manager on this string? Well, the green area here shows how thanks to the dynamic peak manager and its global tracking of the IV curve has shifted its operating voltage to generate better yield. The total production is 7% greater in this system with the dynamic peak manager turned on. The best operating voltage was discovered by about 9 a.m., allowing for this increase. Hmm. So, um, just taking a closer look, can you say a little bit more about why, why the extra yield is showing in the morning on this uh, chart here? Yeah, yeah, so the shading of the system it can occur at any point in the day, uh, and the dynamic peak manager will still be yielding better production. In this particular example, a better maximum power point is found in the morning before the shading scenario vanishes in the mid-afternoon, resulting in the yield gain. So a big question that might be on our minds is why not just use the optimizers to mitigate the shape problems? Well, it's important to note that the optimizers will constantly be performing some work and using some percentage of the generated power of the array to do this work. This reduces the overall efficiency of the array in certain scenarios. Optimizers will work best when shades, when shadows are cast at their longest However, this situation is also when the irradiation is at its lowest point for the day. This situation is nice, but the added power consumption during clear conditions brings room to ponder the actual efficiency of optimizers. The Institute of Energy Systems and Fluid Engineering at Zurich University of Applied Sciences actually found that the advertised efficiencies of some optimizers are often higher than the actual value due to data sheet wording and optimum conditions. For clear to low shading conditions, the annual performance of conventional high efficiency Fronius string inverters is often higher. And we'll get into that on the next slide as well. Lastly, the added manufacturing, maintenance, and replacement of these products overall negatively impacts the environmental benefits of the PV array system itself. So do these optimizers really give added benefit over the dynamic peak manager included in a Fronius inverter? Well, a study by the University of Southern Denmark have shown that string inverters outperform traditional MLPE in 95% of systems. This has to do with more sophisticated shade mitigation by modern string inverters, as explained with the dynamic peak manager, but also with the fact that DC optimizers are only able to recoup energy losses in the first place. So when there is no shade, the DC optimizers only consume energy. There is nothing to optimize, but the DC optimizers work nonetheless. Even in shade, the recouping might not be enough to offset the energy consumption of the optimizer. Only in a small number of systems where there is a heavy shade will you get an increase in energy output. And even then, 
you will have to look at the numbers to see if this justifies the higher cost of the MLPE system, both in terms of CAPEX and OPEX, and to create a positive impact on return on investment. So even in light shading situations, string inverters will, out, will outperform MLPE. It's only in very niche situations where they will be outperformed by MLP. Another disadvantage of DC optimized systems is the large number of com components on the roof. Each power optimizer sits directly behind the solar module and is therefore exposed to heat, cold, rain and snow all year round. This is bad for sensitive power electronics and can have repercussions for servicing and fire risk. DC plug connections are a major source of PV system problems. There are about three times as many of them in a system with power optimizers. We do not believe that the added risk and complexity is needed for the marginal power gain in very niche situations. Yeah, I, I see. I see the argument that you're making here. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of work that's gone into improving DC connector technology over the last few years and, and standardizing things. Um, do you, you know? Do you really see it as that much of an issue out in the field? Generally speaking, Zach, is that? Yeah, for certain. Um, every installation is different, and PV installers work hard to approach an installation with perfection. And no matter the installer's experience or the manufacturer's quality, nothing is guaranteed. We believe that the installation should be as smooth and reliable as possible. The added connection points have caused issues in the past for plenty of installers, and we want to move forward with the simplifying your design. So with all of this said, let's get into some practical details on actually designing a string inverter system. The Solar Creator is a flexible and user-friendly online configuration tool. Users can expect fully comprehensive designs of their plan systems and simulations of production parameters. And this is all on the Fronius Solar Creator website. The Solar Creator tool has many features to help plan many, excuse me, many aspects of your array from simple string configuration to complex load profiling and temperature calculations. The Solar Creator can be used for all of your projects. An automatic report is generated at the end of use to send to customers for key statistics of the plan system. And the Solar Creator allows you to visualize energy usage and production for a simulated year, accurately estimating return on investment. So let's use the Creator tool to design a few systems. So here we have a planned six kilowatt array that we will be that will be attached to the roof in two places. We know that the oversized system can yield better energy production, but we can only fit a small five kilowatt array on the main roof. The subarray will provide an extra kilowatt of power to oversize the inverter. The challenge is that the main roof can sometimes cause shading of the subarray. So a question for you, Aaron, do you think that the dynamic peak manager should be turned on for this system? Uh, the system looks like it has good access to sunlight and no shading issues. So you could probably get by with just keeping the dynamic peak manager on. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we've kind of, it's not a really good indication by this picture, but there is going to be some small um, uh, there's going to be some small shading of that subarray. Um, so I would just recommend while that system might be shaded, we should turn the dynamic peak manager on. Uh, it would only need to be turned on, luckily, on maximum power point tracker number two. Each tracker operates individually, so it can be turned on or off separately. Just a quick note. That uh, dynamic peak manager does consume a very, very, very small amount of energy in the early morning while it scans through the IV curve. So it's only really necessary while shading does it or if the shade is going to occur on the array. 
in a clear condition, it's best to just leave that turned off. The Fronius Solar Creator Tool can deliver some pretty interesting graphs and data about planned arrays. I use the Creator Tool to calculate the string configuration, module counts, and if rapid shutdown is necessary, and much more. We can even get a prediction on solar energy production through the year if the customer's energy usage for a year is known. And here you can see we did manage to oversize the inverter by about 120%, and our customer is going to be really happy with the power gain from this. So a commercial scenario should be much more complicated, right? Well, let's have a run. Let's run this through the solar creator tool as well. Uh, here we have a large 100 kilowatt system that may have certain rows shaded from HVAC units that are located on the roof. Uh, the shade causes us to require two subarrays to limit the shading effect. The solar creator has given us detailed graphs and string configurations for the site. We see that it has generated a useful string configuration for the two arrays and all inverters. The solar creator gives you the power to, to create detailed and reliable PV designs. So as shown in these examples, Fronius string inverters provide a great solution for each of these more complex systems while delivering the highest value to the customer. As you know, value is benefits minus costs. And while Fronius increases the benefits due to smart features like the Superflex design and Dynamic Peak Manager, we also offer lower cost solutions to, uh, to systems that are based on DC optimizers or microinverters. So there are some helpful third-party tools to help you gauge for wire size, much more and much more, including irradiation, expected irradiation, and expected bimodule or bifacial module boost. Here are just a few uh, with Aurora, PV Cyst, and Helioscope by Falsum Labs. Additional resources to use for more information would be the Fronius Solar YouTube channel for excellent webinar and how to content. Fronius technical support resources are available on our website. The Solar Creator is a tool used to size any system with Fronius. And of course, the Fronius Solar SOS tool is used for all troubleshooting, manual information, inverter information, and case creation. If you have ever talked to Fronius Tech Support, you are missing out on the benefits of using Solar SOS for case creation inverter troubleshooting, and so much more. To use Solar SOS, you must have a Fronius USA account and can contact us on how to obtain one at pvsales-usa at fronius.com. And if you have any other questions or any other questions uh, after leaving this webinar, please call us at our technical support hotline. Uh, we'd be very happy to take your call. Our wait times are only on average about three and a half to five minutes. That's fantastic. Yeah, we, we love the support that you all provide to the market and um, to the installers who are out there kind of getting these systems designed and installed. Um, and I, I want to echo um, your your call out of the Fronius SOS program. It's, it's a great program to get involved with. Um, lots of excellent training um, as well as some opportunities to um, get some some uh, I mean, they're essentially leads from Peronius where someone needs something fixed on a site, right? And that person may need additional service down the road. So, um, it's yeah, so the, the SOS tool is absolutely perfect for that. If if you are at the sites and you don't have, um, if you, if you don't have access to a, um, let's say, internet connection or things like that, we actually have a, an SOS app as well for those remote sites that need to be troubleshot on site. You can do it all right there on your phone without actually having to talk to Fronius Tech Support at all. Yeah, it's a really, really fantastic program. So I think now we can move to our question and answers forum. 
Eric? We, we asked some as we were going, Zach, but there are a few that have popped in. Um, so let me go ahead and run through some of them. So a couple, it seems like, came up associated with um, rap compatible rapid shutdown solutions. Um, I'll throw them to you one at a time here. The first one um, was, are we planning on qualifying um, the Fronius string rapid shutdown? Let's see here. Qualifying the string rapid shutdown from Fronius to UL3741. So UL 3741, I think, is the um, uh, the pathway for inverters to comply with uh, rapid shutdown requirements via not having um, conductors on the roof of any kind uh, that are exposed. And so UL 3741, and I'm actually really glad it was brought up. Um, I'm there's not too much that I'm allowed to talk about it right now. We're actually in that certification process for UL 3741. Um, there has been no dates set in stone yet for that application, but I would like to note that the rapid shutdown box wouldn't be necessary or needed for that solution. As a matter of fact, no shutdown would be needed for it. It's a, it's a way to minimize firefighter safety and risk um, by keeping everything within the array boundaries. So the inverter would be installed very close to the array, not needing rapid shutdown at that point. Wouldn't have any of those DC connectors coming or uh, DC uh, wires coming off of the roof at all. Yep, it's essentially, yep. Um, okay, and uh, another question kind of in the same arena. So how does the uh, Peronius Solution. How do Fronia solutions meet the NEC 2020 and 2023 rapid shutdown requirements? Mm, um, so right now, the only rapid shutdown requirements that we are compatible with, with, with the um, manufacturers that I had said previous in the slide, AP Smart and Fire Raptor. So mm -hmm. any other that are not NEC 2020 or 2022 compliant um, wouldn't be, but from what I understand, the, the NEC 2020 code, uh, it changed some of the wording to where inverters would be able to not need rapid shutdown boxes if they were placed on a structure that does not house any people or anything in it. The structure is solely for inverters. So if a ground mount array were to be installed on the site of a building, well, not if the array was to be installed, the inverter could be placed on the site of a building. And that's one thing that I that I think is great to mention on the NEC 2020 and 2022 code, without the need for rapid shutdown. Fantastic. Um, and let's see here. I think we've asked some of these others. Um, any insights? <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. It looks like all the ones. Uh, here um, are coming from you. So any insight into um, how UL 1741SB will affect Fronius inverters? So that's a new requirement um, that's going into effect that specifies how inverters are expected to communicate with um, some of the local grid providers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not gonna, that is not in the works for any uh, application with the SNAP inverter. Um, we do have a, a, we're in the process of developing some newer technologies with a, with our next set of, of inverters that are set to release. Um, not any time that we, that I have access to, but we are in the works of a new inverter. Um, that one should, would more or less be the one that would have those requirements. But as far as the snap inverter with the data manager card, it won't be involved in any of that. Um, communication with the utilities. Sure. Okay. All right. Let me just see if any other questions have come up. That looks like all of the questions that we had. Just double checking my other chat windows here. Um, so it looks like we um, we did get a response there, just confirming that the. Um, that the DigiCell modem is right now um, LTE compatible. Um, 
So um, the, the product that's on offer right now is LTE, and it, it you know mm -hmm. well could change in the future, but that would be a new a new product, and we go through a power transition for that uh, and let our customers know as we're doing that. Um, fantastic. All right, I think that that is all of the, the questions and the updates that I'm seeing here. Awesome. If anybody has any questions, I, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. And if and if you can't uh, if you if you can't come up with one now or maybe something pops in your mind later, as I said, Petronius Tech Support, we we strive on helping our individual installers and we strive to help come up with solutions for them. So please give us a call at any time. Yeah, and we'll be posting a recording of this um, webinar for anyone to check out at a later time. If there's anything that you wanted to uh, review again, or if you wanted to share it with your teams, um, so. Watch out for us posting this as a resource for y'all um, to, to use down the road as well. Excellent. Well, so we have a, a webinar on using all features of the Fronius Solar Creator on December 7th at 1 p.m. Central Time. If you would like to get more information on how to use this tool to simplify your designs, please use the, co the QR code to get more information. This webinar will be recorded for on-demand watch as well. Awesome, so anybody who's interested in getting their first Fronia system designed and getting ready to do their first Fronia install, they could join that webinar and learn how to use your solar.creator tool. Yeah, and, and before the webinar, if you guys would like to um, take a moment to just familiar, familiarize yourself with the tool, it could be a, a nice thing to come in with a little bit of questions because I know that there's a, some parts about the tool might get, might get confusing because there is a lot of parameters that can be adjusted. So play with it ahead of time. If you have any questions before the webinar um, or after the webinar, let us know. Great, thanks. And thanks, so thanks for your attention, everyone. If you have any questions later, make sure to get in touch. And also the QR, the QR code on your screen uh, will, is the Baywa web store. So for all of our Fronius products that are available through Baywa, so you can use that QR code to get to your uh, web store. Yeah, uh, check it out if you, if you have a chance. And if you haven't already signed up um, as a customer, as a Baywa customer, as I mentioned at the top of the call, Go ahead and click on that registration link next to the log on button and um, we'll take you through the process of signing up to work with us. Fantastic. Yeah, Zach, thanks so much for joining us today and running us through all of this. There's a lot of really, really great information for us and for our customers and it's really wonderful to get to hear the latest from the Fronius team. So very much appreciate your time there. Yeah, Aaron, I appreciate you having me. Um, hopefully this isn't a one-off event. Uh, hopefully there'll be more in the future. Yeah, yeah, we'll be looking forward to having you all back to tell us about the latest and greatest uh, very soon. Awesome. Okay.